very nice chatting with you. It was so nice chatting with you. Okay, so thank you very much for attending. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first virtual guest lecture for the Security Studies Program at East Carolina University for Spring Term 2021. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Melissa Graves. The presentation today is based on her doctoral research and the book that she has recently published with Lynn Reiner, titled Nixon's FBI, Hoover, Watergate, and the Borough in Crisis. Dr. Grace holds a BA in English and Communication from Hardin Simmons University in Texas, a law degree, an MA in History, and a PhD in Intelligence History from the University of Mississippi, where she also worked as a project coordinator and as the interim director of their intelligence program. Dr. Grace is currently an assistant professor at the Citadel Military College of South Carolina in Charleston where she teaches courses in intelligence analysis, intelligence ethics, and homeland security. During her studies, she interned in the office of the Attorney General and at the Institute for Criminal Policy Research at King's College London. She has already published extensively in major journals in intelligence and security studies, such as the Cambridge Review in International Affairs, the International Journal of Intelligence and Counterintelligence, and the Journal of Intelligence Analysis. She is a co-author of a popular textbook in intelligence studies, and she has been an active member of the International Association for Intelligence Education. She has presented at conferences held by the International Studies Association, the Five Eyes Analytic Workshop, and the International Association for Intelligence Education. Dr. Grace serves as an American Council on, Ed on Education faculty evaluator for military programs. Today, Dr. Grace will give a guest lecture about the relationship of the FBI and the presidency from a historical perspective. Many thanks for sharing your research with us, Dr. Grace. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishnan, for having me. Um, Dr. Cook, this is such a privilege, so thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm so pleased to, to speak with your students today about Nixon's FBI. Um, so, I think that introduction tells you everything that you need to know about me. Um, I've been working in intelligence studies since 2008. Um, I started as a staff member at University of Mississippi and transitioned to being um, a tenure track faculty member back in 2016 now. Um, and um, it's it's been a delight doing this. So um, I'm going to talk today about Research that I did um, for Nixon's FBI and sort of the relevancy to what's going on today in the US, um, the American presidency and with current events. Um, and then I'm happy to take questions from anyone in the audience. So I hope that this will be a productive conversation um, and I welcome any input that you might have. All right. Um, so I want to start today by talking about Richard Nixon and thinking about what is it that we remember when we think about Richard Nixon. So I'm going to share my screen because I actually have a PowerPoint that I'd like to share with you. All right. Um, can you... Can you see the PowerPoint that I have up? I'm hoping that you can see it. All right. I'm not hearing that you can't see it, so I'm going to proceed. But if there are any problems, just please let me know. Um, all right. So when we think of Watergate, and we think of Richard Nixon, I think most of us probably think about Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, uh, the reporters that worked for the Washington Post who broke most of the stories in the news about Watergate. Um, and in a lot of ways, Woodward and Bernstein Nixon and Watergate has infiltrated 
um, our public understanding of what happened with Watergate. Um, and indeed, they did a great job reporting these stories. In fact, if they had not pursued this story with the journalistic prowess that they did, who knows what would have actually happened with Watergate, right? Um, so they're very deserving of their place in history and, and the American public has great respect and great remembrance for them. But one thing that was sort of missing from the story that they told um, was the FBI. And so when we talk about Watergate and we think about Nixon, oftentimes the FBI isn't the first thing that comes to mind. Um, rather, we think of Woodward and Bernstein. So when I was doing research for my book, I wanted to ask the question of, when we think about the FBI, um, particularly in its early days, I think collectively we, we think of the FBI and we think of J. Edgar Hoover, longtime director. J. Edgar Hoover was director of the FBI for 48 years, nearly half a century. Um, and we've written extensively um, in the historical field and in the journalist field about J. Edgar Hoover as director. But what happens when somebody who is as powerful, who has much of a presence um, in the FBI and also in the American government passes away? That was sort of the starting point for my research for this book. Um, a lot had been Edgar Hoover, but I wanted to know what happened after J. Edgar Hoover. Um, and indeed, that's what brings us here today. Um, so we're talking about, you know, J. Edgar Hoover. Um, as this person who, you know, controlled the Bureau for a very long time. And also we as a society have a lot of, um, a lot of ideas about how we remember Hoover. Um, he's often seen as, you know, this person with a lot of control. Um, he's seen as sort of this um, kind of dark, shadowy force. Um, at least in pop culture, when we look at his depiction in movies, um, the guy with a file on everybody who's important in the U.S. government, um, somebody who can, you know, wield a lot of power behind the scenes. Um, at least that's sort of how I viewed Hoover going into this. And what I was surprised to see is that at the end of his life, Hoover was actually um, kind of weak, kind of a weak figure in the government, and particularly when um, having to face Nixon, um, I think that weakness became quite apparent. And yet, despite the weaknesses that he had at the end of his life, he was also very strong in some very poignant ways that continue to resonate with us today as we watch um, this continued relationship between a U.S. president and the intelligence community and the FBI and an FBI director play out. All right, so first thing to address, um, if we think about J. Edgar Hoover as this, you know, kind of almost weak figure, um, where is that notion coming from? When, when Richard Nixon took over the FBI, uh, I had sort of a fascination with law. In fact, if you know anything about his campaigns, he ran on being the law and order president. Um, that unlike Johnson, who had, you know, let the protest movement, the anti Vietnam War movement get out of hand, um, Nixon was going to represent the silent majority, this idea of middle America, suburban America, middle class, uh, hardworking people that just wanted to the government and um, basically keep the hippies from making a mess of things. Um, 
that's sort of where Nixon fell. And it's interesting to think about Nixon as this law and order figure because we know based on Watergate, um, he sort of does the opposite of law and order. Um, but that's something that he had in his sights um, way before he became president, before he was even a congressman, he actually applied to the FBI to be an FBI agent. And his his application actually was rejected at the time. And it was something that bothered him for a really long time. He wondered, you know, what had happened to his FBI application. And as matured as a congressman, and um, he became friends with J. Edgar Hoover. This is back in his Senate days. He asked him finally, you rejected my application to the FBI. I really wanted to be an FBI agent. And so J. Edgar Hoover did some digging and he found out that his associate director, Clyde Tolson, had uh, looked over the application and wasn't impressed with it and had actually just kind of discarded it and forgotten about it. Um, that fascination with the FBI remained into Nixon's presidency. And when Nixon took over, um, he was very paranoid. He felt like at the time that there was a significant portion of the country that um, didn't share his ideals that didn't view uh, the government or the United States the way that he did. And he wanted to do something about that. And so early in his presidency, he took a young lawyer named Tom Houston, and he asked Houston to assemble the intelligence community and come up with a plan so that the intelligence community could surveil anybody that the Nixon administration had deemed as subversive. Um, so we're talking anti-war protesters, we're talking uh, the radical left, which at this point in time was actually um, becoming more and more violent. We were seeing the weather underground, we were seeing um, bombings that were taken taking place across the country on, on a quite regular basis. They weren't, um, they weren't harming a whole lot of people, but they were doing damage to property. And um, this worried the intelligence community and it also worried Richard Nixon. And so Tom Houston, this young lawyer, um, starts talking to J. Edgar Hoover and um, starts talking to the CIA, NSA, and the military saying, you know, we want to kind of hash out this agreement and what it will do is it will allow the U.S. intelligence community to surveil all these people and, you know, you can help us maintain this law and order that Nixon has promised. J. Edgar Hoover at that point had been director of the FBI for, sorry, uh, 44 years. And, um, when he was asked by Nixon to do this, immediately um, he saw some red flags that concerned him. He was really worried that, um, you know, he was going to be doing the president's bidding, that the president wasn't going to be putting himself out there, but that the FBI was going to be taking on a role in intelligence collection and surveillance that was at best questionable and at worst illegal. Um, and then there was also this, uh, this part to Hoover because he had such a giant ego where he really didn't want these other agencies to infringe upon the FBI's tradition. He didn't want the CIA looking at domestic terror that, that wasn't something that appealed to him at all. If anything, he worried that he would empower other intelligence agencies and maybe allow the FBI to look a lot smaller in comparison. And so for several weeks, Hoover kind of played a dance and, and with the rest of the intelligence community. Um, he fought over things in the like footnotes. Um, he was constantly...
concerned with the agreement. And in fact, at the very end, right as the agreement was signed, Hoover still didn't feel great about it. And so he contacted the attorney general, who at the time was John Mitchell, and he told him about the agreement. And Tom Houston had intentionally left the attorney general out of this conversation. Of course, John Mitchell was pretty upset when he learned what had happened behind his back. And so he called Nixon and convinced Nixon to basically tear up the he had um, spent all this time putting together. So Nixon voided the Houston plan. And the fallout of that um, really resonated with the FBI in some negative ways. First off, the intelligence community was pretty happy with uh, J. Edgar Hoover because once again, come in, he had used his great influence and he had thwarted something that they had actually agreed on. Um, the FBI was upset with Hoover because this was going to give their intelligence folks something to work on. Um, it was going to allow them to support the president, which meant, you know, more resources and more opportunity to work on important jobs that got recognition straight from the, the White House. Um, and when this agreement kind of went away, um, the FBI was left standing there. They weren't collecting the intelligence that the White House really wanted. And so they faced that problem of how do you satisfy a policymaker um, when you're refusing to out the intelligence collection and analysis that the policymaker has asked for. And most importantly, and most consequentially for the FBI, they had upset Richard Nixon. Hoover had irreparably damaged the relationship that he had with Nixon. Um, and he had shown Nixon that, you know, he wasn't going to do his bidding, essentially. And that bothered Nixon. It bothered Hoover. And both of them realized that this was a turning point for the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover started to worry about his job and whether it would be secure. And indeed, um, the archive show that he was right to worry about that because Nixon started talking to White House staffers about forcing J. Edgar Hoover to retire. And um, this is kind of where Hoover left things at the end of his life. Nixon was plotting for a way to replace Hoover with someone who would be more favorable to his policies, who would collect the information that he wanted. And Hoover was trying to justify that even though he was in his 70s, that he could still be the director, that he was still up for the job. Um, Nixon consulted with his staff about how best to fire Hoover. Um, and I mean, how do you how do you fire the person who has led the FBI for nearly a century, who is literally a living legend at the time and and nixon honestly he couldn't figure out how to do it he took nixon to a breakfast a few months before or nixon took hoover to a breakfast a few months before hoover died and um, nixon had planned to fire hoover at the breakfast and hoover showed up he looked pretty spry that day and he talked a good game. And by the end of the breakfast, Nixon had lost his nerve. He couldn't find the nerve to fire Hoover. Um, and so in May 1972, Hoover died in his sleep, still the director of the FBI. And in a lot of ways, that was a relief for Nixon because Hoover was out of the way. He didn't have to upset anybody. He didn't have to fire the legend. And now, finally, he could appoint someone as interim director who would be more favorable to his administration and his policies. What's interesting about this question of, you know, who is Nixon going to appoint 
is that it gets to kind of an age old question about the FBI and American government and the presidency. And that question is to what extent does the presidency control the executive branch, particularly the executive branch within the Department of Justice? So if you know anything about the FBI, you know that um, it is part of the branch that the FBI director in a lot of ways reports to both the attorney general, but also at this point in history, um, reports to the president and indeed is appointed by the president. Um, and so in looking for Hoover's successor, um, we really see Nixon as the first president ever to appoint an FBI director because when Hoover was appointed as director in 1924, he was appointed by an attorney general. This is the president's first time to pick an FBI director. Um, and Nixon knows he's got to get this one right, that a lot is on the line here. So the day that Hoover dies, Nixon names a guy named L. Patrick Gray, who was a Navy captain, as the interim director of the FBI. And um, he knows L. Patrick Gray because L. Patrick Gray had actually served for um, Health and Human Services. He was a Nixon supporter. And um, he, as a military person, was used to following orders. And so um, he came on, and I think it's fair to say that from day one, he had no idea what he was getting into. Because six weeks later, Nixon's plumbers broke into the Watergate Hotel in the middle of the night. And, um, you know, when we think of Nixon, oftentimes we think of Watergate. That's sort of how we remember him. What's interesting about Watergate um, is how the FBI managed this really kind of vulnerable place that they when Watergate took place. So they are literally six weeks out from having lost J. Edgar Hoover. Um, they have an interim director who's new on no law enforcement experience. He's a lawyer, but he's never worked in law enforcement, let alone as an FBI agent. He knows very, very little about the FBI. In the FBI, among senior leadership, there's sort of um, there's sort of a competition going on about who will um, maybe take over as permanent director. Some of the leadership, some of the people that came up under Hoover are really upset that Nixon has appointed L. Patrick Gray as director. And so they're doing whatever they can behind the scenes to maybe make L. Patrick Gray not look as successful as he might be trying to appear. Um, and the person who is first and foremost in that group is Mark Felt, who um, at the time is popularly and anonymously known as Deep Throat. He becomes um, a major source for Woodward and Bernstein and for their Washington Post stories. So the FBI, in looking at, um, at the Watergate break-in, um, has a lot working against it. Surely by by the fact that, you know, Hoover is is just just way. Um and they're working under somebody that really doesn't know what and this proves quite pivotal, uh particularly given the links that Nixon and his staff will go to in order to keep Watergate from being uncovered. Um, so although a lot has been written about Deep Throat, Mark Felt, um, as I started to do the research for this book, I realized that not much had actually been written about the agents that carried out the Watergate investigation. And so 
Um, as I was working on this book, I had the privilege of getting to know five of them, including the main case agent. Um, his name was Angelo Lano, and he worked out of which um, is essentially an FBI office. Um, this was this was strange for me to wrap my head around when I started researching. The FBI has its FBI headquarters in downtown Washington, D. It's right across the street today um, from the Department of Justice on Pennsylvania Avenue in that area. Um, back in the day, it was both uh, FBI headquarters, um, but then you also had just a general FBI office for any sort of crime that might take place in Washington, D.C. And so that was the office that was assigned the Watergate burglary. And um, the way that it happened, it's kind of funny. Um, it, it happened overnight. Um, the Washington field was looking for an agent that was familiar with the Watergate complex. And so they called Angelo Lano. He was a fairly young guy. I think he was like 30. Um, when he was working on this. And he had worked um, some robberies and burglaries that had taken place at the Watergate Hotel. So he seemed like a good fit and um, had no idea the day that he was called in that Saturday, the burglary kind of took place on a Friday into Saturday morning. Um, Lano had no idea when he went in Saturday morning that he was going to be spending the next few years consumed by this case. Um, when he went in, it was just a burglary. Um, but he realized very quickly that it was something more. And he went to the D.C. jail um, the morning after the burglary. The burglars were in the D.C. jail and um, they wouldn't talk. They wouldn't say anything. They were dressed smartly in suits. And um, I want to show you a picture. I found this to be quite interesting. So I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, share my application window. Actually, we'll go back to this. Okay. So I'm going to share this again. I'm hoping that you can see this. This is this is a, a class photo. And each batch of new agents goes through an FBI training course. Um, the length of time and where it's held has changed over the years. Now it's held at Quantico. It's like four or five months long. Um, this is from a publication called The Grapevine. Um, it's a publication that the FBI distributes to former agents, almost like a newsletter, like an alumni newsletter, but for FBI agents. And this was an FBI class and they attended training. They were new agents, class number three from August 22nd to November 30th, 1966. And if you look on the front row, uh, one, two, three, four people from the left, you'll see a guy in um, a black suit. And he has black hair, um, dark tie. He's wearing essentially the, the FBI um, uniform at this point. Didn't even like it when agents wore anything other than a white shirt and a dark suit. Um, it was very rigid, very, uh, you looked how Hoover wanted you to look. That guy uh, from the left on the front row, that's Angelo Lano in his training class. And if you go one person over to the right, in the middle, looks like he has kind of blonde hair. Um, that's James McCord. He's an FBI agent was in the FBI class with Angelo Lano. He's also one of the Watergate burglars. So Lano arrives at the DC jail. He sees his former classmate from FBI training there. Um, he sees some Cubans there that speak Spanish. 
and nobody's talking. They go to the Watergate Hotel and they find a hotel room where the Watergate burglars had been keeping their stuff. They find um, a lot of cash. Um, they find the, the cash is, um, you know, like, it looks like it's come fresh from the bank. The serial numbers are in consecutive order. Um, they find, um, you know, evidence that they've been there. They find recording devices. They find all this stuff. They think, okay, something's going on here. Um, and as the investigation, they start to realize what's happened, that um, they stumbled upon a burglary. They stumbled upon one of the biggest burglaries in all of history. And um, they start to feel like that there's some sort of um, conspiracy going on and that maybe the White House is involved. And Lano tells this great story of um, going to the White House and he's talking to John Dean, who is Nixon's attorney. And he catches John Dean in a lie fairly early on um, as, you know, he's questioning different White House people. Um, he realizes that John Dean is not telling the truth. Um, they were trying to figure out the contents of um, one of the White House safes. There was a guy from the CIA, his name was E. Howard Hunt, and he had a White House office. And in his office, he had a safe. And Lana was asking questions to J John Dean, trying to figure out, you know, does this have an office? I, I hear he has an office, but can you verify that he has an office? John Dean is saying, no, 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 he doesn't have an office. Don't know what you're talking about. Several days later, John Dean calls Lano and says, I have a box for you from Howard Hunt's White House office. And in that moment, Lano realizes something isn't right here. And so as the weeks pass, there's quite a bit of tension between the Nixon White House and L. Patrick Gray, who is popularly known among agents at the time as Three Day Gray because he was hardly ever in the office. He was off visiting all of the FBI field offices. Once he was appointed FBI interim director, he thought, this is amazing. I want to stay here. I hope that I'm appointed the permanent director. And he essentially went on a campaign trail to all of the FBI offices giving speeches, trying to appeal to the agents so that he would have their support for becoming the permanent director. Meanwhile, Nixon is realizing, okay, this is problematic. Um, they are looking at my staff for any sort of wrongdoing. Um, this isn't good. And indeed it wasn't good. Um, he was putting a lot of pressure on L. Patrick Gray to essentially stop the investigation. And L. Patrick Gray has been on the job of six or seven or eight weeks when this pressure is coming his way. He's a military guy. He's used to following orders. And so when he's given a box um, of things from E. Howard Hunt's safe, and he's told by Dean, make sure this never sees the light of day. He, he takes it and he burns it, and he's effectively burning evidence related to the Watergate break-in on orders of Sin's counsel. Um, he is also um, invited to a meeting with the uh, assistant CIA director. On the CIA to tell the FBI that they've stumbled into a CIA operation. This was believable because the Watergate burglary was planned, a CIA operative, and it was carried out by a CIA informants that had um, started working for the CIA during the Bay of Pigs invasion. 
So on its face, this seemed believable. Um, the assistant director from the CIA essentially kind of refused to do this. Um, there was something called the smoking gun tape where, you know, Nixon is, is kind of masterminding that to tell the FBI, this is our thing, stay out of it. And at the time, there was an agreement between the CIA and the FBI that if the FBI had somehow, you know, accidentally stumbled into a CIA operation, the CIA would alert the FBI of that and the FBI would back off. Um, and so Nixon tried to use um, sort of that formality between the agencies to his advantage. It didn't work, but the tape recording of that, once it's found out after the Nixon tapes are released, that becomes the end of him. Um, so there's so much going on during this time. Um, it takes quite a while for these agents to find people that will talk because the White House staff members um, to FBI interviews. So the FBI agents are, you know, going to creep, which is um, the campaign office for Nixon, sort of where the burglary originated out of. They're going there, they're asking to interview creep employees, and the employees are coming out. But I mean, they're, they're sitting, you know, like, I'm an FBI agent. And um, I would have a creep employee sitting across from me, facing me, and then if I were to do this, how it worked for them, I would have John Dean sitting by me. So as, um, as the creep employee is answering my questions and I'm, you know, asking, did you have anything to do with this, they can see been placed there that day, essentially like telling them, no, you're not answering this. So the FBI agents are just really like, they just keep hitting a wall as they're trying to talk to these people. They can't figure out why this is. And um, it's not until uh, one of the secretaries calls um, out of the blue one evening on one of the agents' home phones and says, I need to talk to you alone. I need to talk to you outside of the office because I have some information to tell you. And once they're able to talk to an accountant from Creep, they're able to see that, oh, wow, there's, there's money involved that funded the burglary and it goes all the way back to the White House. And then, of course, later on in the investigation, John Dean turns and ends up um, Basically, he's been kind of made to be the fall boy by Nixon. And so he decides, you know what, this game is over. I'm going to start talking. And then, you know, things really kind of take off at that point. Special prosecutor is appointed. Um, and at that point, you know, Woodward and Bernstein are, are writing about this. Um, it's getting a lot of popularity um, in, in the media are concerned. And eventually, in August of 1974, and resigns. Um, but what I think is amazing about the Watergate investigation, and why I think that it is prescient in so many ways that nobody at the time would have anticipated um, in today's events, is that there's so much left unresolved in this idea of what is the relationship president to the FBI. As the FBI is carrying the water investigation, they are investigating the president that they're not just carrying out this investigation on behalf of the president as you know part of the executive branch, but they are investigating the president, who they work for, who they answer to. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned that at the end of his life, um, Edgar Hoover was 
very weak, that um, he was weak in the sense that, you know, Nixon was questioning whether he should continue to lead the FBI. He was older. He, you know, by some accounts, he wasn't in great health. Um, however, even at the end of his life, he maintained this this sense of being impenetrable with Nixon. Nixon couldn't muster up the courage to fire him. Um, even though he wasn't popular for disbanding the Houston plan, he did it. So he was able to stand up to Nixon in a way that I, I don't know that any other figure at that time was able to. I mean, he had just he had been there 48 years. He had been there through so many different presidents. Um, it was clear that, you know, Nixon, no matter how powerful he was as president, um, was never going to have a leg up on, on Hoover in some ways because Hoover had been there for long, knew so much, was so adept at working politics. Um, and, and Nixon recognized that. Contrast that with L. Patrick Gray who was new on the job, used to doing what he was told, um, and basically folded with the Watergate investigation. Um, he was the one that authorized John Dean to uh, sit in on those interviews that the FBI agents were doing. He was the one that destroyed evidence um, at Nixon's request. He was the one that, in a lot of cases, um, made the investigation harder than it had to be. Um, and yet at the same time, he was going up for confirmation as the permanent FBI director. So he really did walk a tightrope in that he needed to do well enough in the Watergate investigation that the Senate would confirm him as permanent director. But support entirely. And um, he, he was getting what he wanted. So he wanted to be confirmed as permanent director. As he underwent his confirmation hearings, it became very clear that he was compromised. It, not even, even before they knew what he had done with the Watergate evidence, there were speeches that he had given um, that were so favorable to Nixon. Um, he was asking FBI agents to help him compile reports on crime that the Nixon campaign could use um, to help get Nixon reelected. He was blurring the lines between um, what a government agency should do and you know a government agency just becoming a partisan arm of the president and so when it, he went up for confirmation there were senators that had called him out on this and over the course of the confirmation he finally found his voice he finally started to speak out against Nixon to affirm that he wasn't going to let the president meddle in what the FBI was doing. Um, but it was too little too late because at that point he had already compromised the Watergate investigation in so many ways. And he ended up confessing to a senator that he had also destroyed evidence from E. Howard Hunt's safe. And when that came out before the Senate, along with the fact that he had basically allowed John Dean to supervise the entire Watergate investigation, he lost the support of Congress. And to be fair, it wouldn't have mattered at that point because he also completely lost the support of Richard Nixon. Um, Nixon was paying attention to these confirmation hearings. And when he saw that Gray was not going to stick up for his administration, that he was going to admit to, you know, doing these things that Nixon or his staff had asked Gray to do. He wanted no part in that. And John Dean is actually quoted as saying, um, you know, at that point, Nixon had decided to let Gray twist slowly in the wind. 
Um, he wasn't going to, you know, intervene because at that point he knew he didn't have to. He realized that Gray wasn't going to be appointed and there was nothing that he was going to do to help that situation. Gray, as far as he was concerned, was persona non grata to him. When I started this research and I was looking at the FBI's investigation of Watergate, looking at how he was in a lot of ways say what you will about hoover hoover did horrible things i mean you know this is the guy who ran surveillance against martin luther king who really did use his information to intimidate politicians um you know was a good friend of a lot of cold warriors back in the day and a lot of people you know look at instances in history where j edgar hoover took it too far in terms of surveillance or investigation or prosecution, right? So Hoover is not this um, sterling figure in American history. There are, there are a lot of problems with Hoover. Um, but say what you will about Hoover um, as, you know, the FBI director, he held his own against Nixon. And I think that's important and that becomes apparent when you look at all Patrick Gray. And when you look at the Watergate investigation through the lens of Al Patrick Gray, it almost seems like the Watergate investigation was a failure, right? Because we have this director who is not a great director, is not standing up to the president, is really, you know, not even really tuned in to the organization that he's leading at the time. And that's all problematic. My perspective of the Watergate investigation significant when I started to talk to the investigators, the FBI agents. And when I started to talk to them, um, they were initially very reluctant to talk to a historian. And I think part of that is just generational. They come from a time in the FBI where, you know, you do your work and you um, do the best you can and you retire and then that's it. You don't write a book about it. You don't talk to journalists. You don't talk to historians. You take that to the grave and that's it. That's what you do as a good FBI agent. So there was that attitude um, that I was working with. And then also I think, and this is fair, there was just this fear of, you know, there's a historian here probing around at what I did with my career. You know, what is this person going to write about me? Um, so it took a while to get all of the agents to start talking. When they did start talking, I noticed that to a person, every single one of them were so proud of the work that they'd done. And coming off the heels of looking so closely at Al Patrick Gray, I was sort of surprised. Um, but for them, they viewed the work that they did um, on the day FBI's Watergate investigation as just a shining example of what the FBI is capable of doing. And for them, the fact that given everything that L. Patrick Gray had done to not help the investigation, given the fact that Hoover died just weeks before it began, given the fact that the associate director of the FBI, Mark Felt, was deep throat, was taking their reports, um, the information that they were uncovering and secretly feeding it to the Washington Post and then coming back to the office, blaming them for doing that. Despite all these things, they ran a successful investigation. They were able to uncover the leads. They were able to trace the money, follow the money back to creep. They were able to, you know, basically uncover all of the evidence that led to Nixon resigning. Popularly, we attribute that to Woodward and Bernstein because they were the ones that were publishing that in the Washington Post. But Woodward and Bernstein were publishing that based upon the reports that they were getting from the FBI. So this information that led to Nixon's resignation was uncovered 
by these FBI agents. And in realizing that, that, um, that led me to an insight about the FBI, and that is that even when you have an FBI director that may be, you know, at best problematic in their job, at worst, um, trying to interfere with the work of agents, at least in the case of the Watergate investigation, the power of a director only stretched so far. And one of the FBI agents that, um, that worked on the Watergate investigation described the job, the role of an FBI agent as an independent contractor, almost. And if you think about the FBI and the fact that you know they have headquarters in Washington, D.C., but then spread out all over the country, you have 56 field offices throughout you know, all 50 states, territories, Puerto Rico, um, they have, um, on top of that, they have attaches um, across the world. So FBI agents are used to doing investigations, you know, they could be working in Washington, D.C., but they could also be working in Montana, or they could be following you know, where a case leads, I don't know, all the way in Afghanistan or Europe or wherever, anywhere in the world, you can have an FBI agent working on an investigation. And the fact that FBI agents carry out these investigations, oftentimes without too much intervention from headquarters, means that they sort of, um, they develop kind of a persona of, you know, they're able to go out and they're able to do their job and, you know, heads can do their thing, but the agents are going to do their thing. They ultimately actually have quite a bit of discretion because they're the ones doing the real work of the investigation. They're the ones interviewing the people involved. They're the ones that are actually sifting through the financial records. They're the ones listening in through the surveillance tapes. And because they're the ones carrying out the investigation, that gives them the discretion at those really tense moments of, you know, do I want to pursue this as, you know, aggressively as I possibly can? And in the case, And the agents that were working with him at one point, I think there were like 34 agents that were assigned to the Watergate investigation. They just wanted to solve the burglary. They just wanted to get to the bottom of what happened. And that enabled them to carry out a successful investigation, even when the director was essentially functioning as an arm of the president. And, um, I guess that sort of leads me to the final point that I want to make about the FBI um, and the American presidency. And that is that, you know, really, if we take this to today, to present times, um, I mean, we've, within the past year, or a little over a year, we've seen two MP hearings. Um, we've seen investigations carried out by the FBI against a president again. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of constitutional questions that remain unanswered. Um, one, of the, one of the legacies of Watergate, one of the sad things, I think, that we didn't really realize the consequences of this until just a few years ago, um, when Watergate happened, we saw the American public be um, just filled with indignation towards the presidency, towards Nixon, for you know what he did with Watergate, and it led to a lot of hearings. Um, it led to the Church Committee, which was. Um, essentially a, a year-long hearing by the Senate into activities by the FBI and by the CIA. Um, they wondered, you know, if, if L. Patrick Gray can destroy evidence on behalf of the White House, if the White House 
can carry out a burglary, um, essentially political subterfuge against, um, you know, the Democratic opponent. What else? what other skeletons are in the closet? And that's what the church committee set out to address. What ended up happening is as, you know, the CIA and the FBI sort of laid bare all of the things that they had done within the last 20 years, we realized, oh my goodness, liberties these agencies are violating, they violated the civil liberties of Americans. And that was absolutely true. I mean, we saw the CIA spying illegally on Americans. Basically, they weren't too, too torn up when the Houston plan, you know, fell by the wayside, because actually they'd already been doing all that stuff anyway. The Houston plan was just going to give them written authorization to do it. Um, and all of this came out during the church committee. And, um, as the American public looked at what these intelligence agencies had done, we saw people's reaction shift from being appalled at what Nixon had done to being appalled at all the ways that intelligence agencies had violated Americans' rights to privacy, to free speech, to be free from unlawful search and seizure. So the legislation that followed the church committee primarily sought to protect Americans from the intelligence community. To say, all right, no longer can the intelligence community infringe upon the rights of American people. Um, and that's where, you know, the FISA, um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act comes from, um, and some of the you know Attorney General's guidelines that were placed on the FBI after the Church Committee were all meant to protect um, American citizens. But the question that Congress never really addressed was the original question that Watergate raised, and what do you do when a president has gone too far? Um, when they have abused their Article II powers. And legal scholars at the time, people who studied the FBI around the time that Nixon was president, identified this as being a shortcoming of um, legal precedent, of our understanding of the law. And um, because the tide had turned so much by the time the church committee um, had finished their investigation, and by the time that Congress had enacted new laws, reel in um, the intelligence community, it, it kind of fell by the wayside. And so now we're sort of seeing this again, where once again we're kind of questioning, all right, what what are a president's um, Article II powers related to the intelligence community, um, and you know answer these questions, I, I foresee that, you know, throughout history, they'll continue to arise just because they are kind of critical to our understanding of how the FBI functions, how it is both an arm of the president while also having the authority to investigate a president. And that remains problematic to this day. Um, so I have spoken for a very long time. Um, I hope this made sense. I appreciate your attention. And I think at this point, I would love to answer it up to, open it up to questions. So thank you very much for your excellent presentation. So I, joined, I enjoyed it very much. And let's have some questions. So you can uh, type your question in the chat box uh, and I can read it. Um, <clears throat> Maybe I start with a question for you. <laughs> so, so do you think that the FBI was politicized at the time of the Watergate investigation? And how do you think is the FBI doing today in terms of politicization? Yeah, that's, oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> and there's a lot to unpack there. So thank you for that. Um, yes, I think at the time, 
uh, under Gray's actions, yes, I think the FBI was politicized in the sense that, you know, in his testimony before Congress in his Senate hearing, senators asked Gray, you know, how do you view the role of a president and how do you view the role of an FBI director? And Gray essentially admitted, I view my role as the FBI director as somebody that answers to the president and does what he asks. And that was really problematic to the senators because they were wanting to hear an FBI director say, I operate independent of a president, that I, you know, I don't just follow orders. And Gray couldn't give them that assurance. Um, and so I do think that because of Gray's actions and really because of his views towards the presidency that yes, the FBI was politicized again today. I, you know, what's interesting about that is I think a lot of this has to do with our own political opinions about how we view what's happened in politics, how we view the Mueller investigation. We view James Comey and whether President Trump's firing of him was lawful or unlawful. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, um, it's politicized to the extent that now, unfortunately, um, the American public's view of the FBI is very partisan in a way that I don't think that it was um, even, you know, five years ago. Um, I, I've paid attention to Christopher Wray, the director that took over after James Comey, and I think, you know, he has really kind of an impossible task to fill, um, taking over the FBI during the Mueller investigation. Once again, you know, the FBI was staffing the Mueller investigation. I mean, the FBI were helping to carry out the Mueller investigation. So essentially, I mean, you, you had a situation that was very to Watergate. Um, and Christopher also, you know, was working and answering to, you know, the attorney general's office. And I mean, it was a very precarious situation. Um, I know that in talking to agents that worked, um, that worked for the FBI during the Watergate investigation, um, they don't like comparisons. When I would bring that up with them, they, they didn't, they just didn't want to go there. Um, I think it's hard to kind of reevaluate what you've done um, in light of, you know, the things today. I think they just wanted to keep it separate. But I, I, I did get a sense from a lot of the agents that they just, they sort of felt like that the FBI in general had been politicized today just because of public opinion of it. Um, so I, I think I would say that, yes, it has been politicized, maybe unintentionally. But I think we definitely have political views uh, towards the FBI based on our own political views. Thank you. Are there any any other questions? So, what was uh, your most surprising finding when you did the research? Was there anything you didn't expect to find? Yeah, that's, that's a I, that's a fun question to consider. So the, I think the thing that I found really wasn't expecting um, was that uh, Mark Felt, Deep Throat, had actually um, very cool time in the Watergate investigation, halted the investigation. Um, and I didn't know this about him. And I always... and Woodward and Bernstein. And I had this idea that, you know, Deep Throat was going to stop at nothing to make sure that, um, you know, Nixon's indiscretions were uncovered. So that was sort of my idea of felt. But in talking to Angelo Lano, I realized that early on, felt had actually stopped Lano's investigation, had halted it. 
And I remember, you know, this email exchange with uh, Mr. Lano and, and I read that and I thought, I must be misreading this because there's no way that felt actually like impeded the Watergate investigation. And so I reached out to Mr. Lano and I said, okay, so I just tell you how I interpreted this. And I, I think this is what you're saying and I'm sure I'm wrong. So please correct me. And he was like, no, I, I that's a fair assessment that at that point in time, um, El Gray had taken over as director and Mark Belt was really upset about that because he viewed himself as sort of the success mover. He had spent his entire career climb the FBI leadership ladder. He was third. Um, in line behind Hoover. So it was Hoover and then Hoover's assistant director, Clyde Tolson, who was also very old and retired as soon as Hoover died. And then Mark Felt. So Mark Felt believed, you know, like in the hierarchy, I am going to be director. And so when he wasn't director, he was really, really upset. Um, and I knew that, and I knew that that had contributed to his motivation to leak information to the Washington Post, that he was just really disgruntled. What I didn't realize is that in the earliest days of the investigation, it appears through agents' accounts that Mark Felt was still trying to sort of determine which way the wind was going to blow. And he was trying to figure out, okay, how do I make myself look good here, but not make L. Patrick Gray look too good? because he didn't want Gray appointed as permanent director. I think there was probably still something in him that was hoping Gray will, Gray's only interim. He's not going to become permanent, so maybe I can take over. Um, and, and, and trying to figure out which way things were going to go, at one point, Lano was saying, you know, we need to interview these people so that we can provide information to the grand jury the investigation has stopped, help us. And felt just let that memo, that very desperate memo, just sit on Gray's desk while he was out of town and felt, um, you know, it was known to everybody that when Gray went out of town, felt was in charge, felt had the authority to sign anything that was directed to Gray. Gray was out of town for days at a time. So he knew that in leaving that memo on Gray's desk, he knew what he was doing. He knew he was just letting it sit there. Um, and that to me was very surprising to realize that, um, you know, we think about Deep Throat as sort of the hero of Watergate, that had he not, you know, met with Woodward and Bernstein in the dark parking garages at night, that, you know, Watergate would never have happened. And I'm sure, you know, Part of that is true. The lore, there's some truth to that. But the other truth is that, you know, he stopped the investigation. And furthermore, it was really interesting to hear these agents. I mean, they have a lot of animosity towards Felt because Felt was their supervisor and they were giving their, their reports to Felt. So they were interviewing witnesses and then they were handing those reports over to Felt. They were promising these witnesses that their information would be kept secret. And then they would see the Washington Post two days later and it would be their report almost word for word. And this happened with Judy Hoback, um, the accountant that some of the agents interviewed. And I mean, the agents were just, they were flummoxed because she was so upset. They had promised that they would keep everything that she said a secret. And then she opened up the Washington Post and there was everything that she had said to them. And, you know, the reason that that ended up in the Post in the first place was felt. So I think also this idea that, you know, felt in being deep throat was essentially throwing the agents under the bus over and over and over again. And there were times where, even accuse them of being leakers, which is just unbelievable. Um, so I would say that was the most surprising thing, was just realizing this new dimension to Mark Felt and Deep Throat. 
<laughs> yeah, that's quite fascinating. So we have a question from a student. Uh, do you believe it should be important that agents, FBI and beyond, put aside political views within the job? Is that even possible in today's political climate? Yeah, that, that is a wonderful question. Thank you for that. Um, so, yes, I think in an ideal world, right, um, everybody would be able to put aside their political views and be completely unbiased. And, you know, I work in an intelligence department, and so um, I don't just study the FBI. I'm also, you know, teaching intelligence analysis to students who end up going to work for the intelligence community. And we talk a lot about politicization of intelligence that, you know, we, we want to see people in the intelligence community with a political um, analysis to policymakers. So that's the hope. And I think the best analysts are able to do that. Um, but of course, we're human and we're biased. I have noticed in recent years, I have noticed that um, just students, former students that I've had that, that work for the FBI um, have been very, very, very careful. I, I think the FBI has clamped down extensively among its agents that, you know, you can write the Hatch Act, which is a federal act where, you know, you can't show partisan favor towards candidates. Um, you need to be apolitical. Do not be putting stuff on social media where you're supporting one candidate over the other. So I think the organization has um, really, like, I don't know if they've changed their training or what, but I can see from the outside looking in that um, analysts and agents are a lot more careful about what they say. I, I, I mean, I think it's crucial that Americans believe that the FBI is carrying out their work lawfully, regardless of where your political feelings lie. I think that the point where you know, if you're part of a particular political persuasion and you no longer think the FBI can operate lawfully, that's problematic for democracy. Um, so I think, it, you know, this idea that FBI agents work not for an administration, but they work for the Constitution, um, I think that's critical to just our understanding of the FBI and, and really is critical to democracy. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Uh, anybody else? Uh, okay, so I guess we've reached the end of the scheduled time. So thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, we are thank you very glad. much. <laughs> This was so much fun and such a privilege. Thank you for having me. And... Okay, then <clears throat> I wish everybody a, a, a nice evening and uh, see you next time for another presentation that we hope to schedule. Goodbye. Thank you very much. It was nice meeting you, Dr. Graves. You, Dr. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Armin. This was wonderful. Take care.